Hello and welcome to Food Safety Fridays. My name is Simon Timpoli from the International Food Safety and Quality Network and our special guest presenter today is Maria Sandoval from Trace Analytics and the subject we're going to be talking about today is biolog and microbial identification at Trace Analytics. So welcome Maria, nice to have you back again. Good morning. Nice to see you. Um, as we do every time, can you tell us where you're joining us from today? Um, I'm all the way in Austin, Texas. Uh, we've actually had our first cold snap over here, so it's actually kind of cool. It never gets cold in November, so this is nice. But yeah. Right. So what does what's cool then? Uh, probably high 70s. I think right now it's um, 58 degrees Fahrenheit outside, right. so it's pretty yeah. chilly. Bit chilly. For okay. us. For you, yeah. <laughs> That's a heat wave for us in, in the <laughs> UK. Okay, uh, everyone, let us know where you're joining from in the sidebar. Uh, it's always nice to know. Uh, it's a bit of a new interface, um, and we've got our fancy backgrounds. I hope you can notice. Um, I hope you like them. Uh, I'm going to play the sponsor ads now. Uh, we're back in a couple of minutes. Okay. The world of food has changed a lot in the last hundred years. But one thing that doesn't change? Ensuring the quality and safe handling of food. No matter what changes are yet to come, we're proud to always be on our client's side, shaping the future of food today and tomorrow. AIB International, ever onward. Uh, let's get the slides up then. Um, I'll be back for the Q&A later, but for now, I'll, uh, I'll hand you over to Maria. Great. Hi, guys. Like Simon said, we're going to talk a little bit about the biolog and what microbial identification options are out there, and then specifically what microbial identifications are out at Trace Analytics. 
I'm the lab director here. I've been here for um, about four years and I have over 20 years of experience in cellular molecular biology and microbiology. I'm currently working on the ISO uh, 8573-7 as the project leader and that's the compressed air section as well as NFPA and um, other accrediting standards. So if you have any questions regarding any of the ISO standards that we're about to talk about, um, just let me know. So um, I found it alarming that around the world, there's an estimated 600 million people. So that's almost one in 10 fall ill after eating contaminated food each year. And so the concerns over food safety has been worsened by the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I'm sure everybody has um, been aware of the necessity to retrain on hygiene, retrain on aseptic technique, which we'll talk a little bit about, especially if you're sampling. Um, but essentially, there needed to be a system to tackle this level of uh, food safety incidences. And so to tackle that, there are coalitions around the world. There's uh, GFSI, there's SQF, there's ISO, there's the CDC, there's the FDA, uh, BRC. All of these coalition members are addressing these challenges that are facing food safety systems uh, in their supply chains and, and the markets that operate in them. And so they're there to help raise the food safety bar globally. Um, and I think, you know, that's one thing that we forget sometimes when we're doing audits is, uh, you know, it's just another audit. It's, it's hard, it's stressful, but really what it's there is to make sure that your facility isn't contributing to that one in 10. Um, and so I think it's everyone has the right to have access to safe and nutritious and nourishing food. And so that's why it's important to have these coalitions and these standard operating procedures um, in every community ac across the globe. And it's important that facilities are mindful of food safety and how food security are closely linked. So today we're gonna to talk a little bit about uh, how food safety is a public health, health priority, um, what the standards are saying about microbial monitoring. Uh, and lastly, and the longest part of this presentation will be about techniques, how to identify the microorganisms. And there's um, a little bit of a tier step. So we'll talk about broad questions if you only care about certain aspects of microbial monitoring all the way down to the most specific parts. Do you care about genus and species? Um, so that uh, that is what we're gonna talk about today. Uh, if you need to get in contact with me, my name and email address is at the bottom of every slide and our customer service phone number is there also at the bottom of the link. So let's talk a little bit about food safety. Um, we know that unsafe food poses a global health threat. I just talked about how one in 10 can fall ill to that. And that in and of itself is enough to address the food safety threats that currently exist. And so what kind of threats are there? Well, today we're going to harp on the microbial aspect of it, but there's other threats. There's microplastics, there's particulates, there's... Um, uh, quality, making sure that the the uh, recipes or the ingredients are high quality, they're mixed well, um, anything like that. And, and it's important to address what your facility can do to keep your products safe. And it seems redundant, but I can't stress enough how often we're getting phone calls from um, customers that are saying, you know, I know that I need to do this, but I just don't know how to do it. I don't even know where to start. And, and um, Simon has that IFSQN blog, which I think is an amazing, um, an amazing tool that you guys can really uh, benefit from because there's a lot of people who have the same questions. And a lot of the time, these questions that are popping up have to do with hazard analysis, critical con control points, especially when it comes to microorganisms. Um, and we'll talk a little bit later of how, how and why micro is so different um, from other types of contaminants. But it is important 
that when you are going to address food safety in your facility, that you know what parts are important and what you considered hazard, what you consider risk, high risk, low risk, um, and that you define those risks for your system. So that really comes into play as a principle of the um, HACCP and contaminant monitoring. So when it comes to monitoring these contaminants, there are, um, there are different types that you need to be mindful of. And I just touched a little bit on some of the contaminants, but you need to be mindful of the contaminants. Um, and there are a ton of classes uh, that you can take to recognize what a critical control point should be. Um, and when you do these types of HACCP analyses um, and risk assessments, you will learn based on what part of your facility you're in, how often you need to make these measurements, how often you need to be performing these um, monitoring tests. And I'm gonna say this a bunch of times during my talk, but you cannot be monitoring something that you're not testing. And I know that sounds silly, but it's not good enough to say, oh, I'm just monitoring it. If you don't have any audit trail, <clears throat> excuse me, or if you don't have any test reports um, from an accredited or a calibrated system. So here at Trace, we're A2LA accredited. Um, but if you have like an inline system, you need to be making sure that's all uh, calibrated and things like that. But your food safety team really needs to have an outline of these procedures that effectively define what and how you're measuring these systems uh, and then document that. Uh, each time you're analyzing your critical checkpoints. So some of the types of contaminants that you're going to be mindful of when you're looking at food safety are physical contaminants, um, plastics, woods, metals, um, anything chemical, uh, cleaning agents, which I bet is a huge thing right now because of COVID-19. Uh, the CDC and the World Health Organization came out with a list of cleaning agents, um, and each of those cleaning agents is a little bit different. Um, I know it's not food, but in hospitals, typically they're using, you know, hydrogen peroxide type gases. Um, for food safety, you're using uh, bleaches. Sometimes you're using also hydrogen peroxide gases, uh, isopropanol, things like that. Um, but when you're using certain contaminants, uh, <laughs> the labs can actually see it. So um, I'm thinking of Lysols. We can see Lysols in your compressed air as uh, limonene and pinene. Um, I'm thinking toxins. If you're not... Um, controlling the temperatures of some of your products, your food products, they can off toxins, uh, pesticides. If you have farm to table or if you have um, any food uh, growing type of protocols, you got pesticides you need to be mindful of. Allergens, uh, peanuts, any nuts, um, dairy, things like that. But lastly, what we're gonna focus this talk on is the bacteria uh, and fungi contaminants. Um, and so when you're looking at bacteria and fungi as a type of contaminant, you need to be identifying critical control points. Um, and you need to be mindful of if they're high risk or low risk. Um, you need to establish critical limits. One thing that I'm hearing a lot of from our customers is, hey, um, can you please tell me how many is too many? And We'll get it. We'll we'll touch on that in a little bit, but um, you guys need to be determining that based on your risk assessments um, and monitoring. What type of monitoring do I need to do? Is it good enough to just have a number, or do I need to be pathogen specific? If you've got an entire uh, greenhouse full of spinach, uh, I can guarantee you, you probably need to be pathogen specific. But if you're just boxing up ready to eat meals, maybe you only care about bio burden, or maybe you do care about um, gram negative organisms. So those are the types of questions you're gonna start asking yourself when it gets time to um, establish the type of monitoring that you're gonna do. So the next thing that um, we're gonna talk about today is what are the standards saying about this monitoring? 
So right now we have these international standards. Um, SQF is offered um, internationally. It's a certification that a food manufacturing or any food safety facility uh, that any food facility that needs to be mindful of food safety uh, can do to assess and assure that their compressed air, their ambient air, their water, their surface, um, and your food at risk are monitored for microbial contamination. So what I've done here, there are 10 codes in SQF, um, and each of those codes, um, each of those codes talk about something a little bit different. Excuse me. <clears throat> so what I've done here is pulled out randomly uh, edition nine, which is the most recent SQF edition. And this is the food safety code for food manufacturing. And inside of that, you will see there is a uh, glossary in the back that talks about compressed air monitoring. And inside of that definition, it talks about a program that includes particles, water, oil, microbiological and relevant gaseous testing in compressed air and other gases. So you guys in uh, beverage need to be mindful of your compressed air. Uh, if you guys are uh, mixing things with your compressed air, if it's in direct contact or indirect contact, um, you know, some of my favorite chocolate bars, you, that's direct contact when the chocolate's going blown off. So you just need to be mindful that SQF uh, is an internationally um, used standard and it's telling you guys it is time to start monitoring these elements for microbial contamination. There's also ambient air. Um, it's If it's in a high risk area, it is not, um, it's, it's known, right? That when you walk outside, you take a deep breath, you're breathing in microorganisms. They are everywhere. So that's why some of these um, standards say, if you're going to be testing ambient air, be mindful in some areas that it's high risk, but it's always important to note what the baseline is in your facility. So it's always important to have that kind of background information. The other parts that they address are also surface sampling, settle plates, um, water, ice supplies, all of that are requirements and considered risk-based and require at least minimum annual testing. So that's SQF. And again, there's 10 other, um, there's 10 other codes that fall into SQF. The other one is BRC. It's a global standard, very similar. Um, this is specifically the one that I pulled for BRC for the global standards is for packaging and packaging materials. Um, they talk specifically about uh, specific pathogens. Are they present? Is it a risk to your product? Is it a risk to your environment? Um, you know, we all know about ice cream and listeria, but what about enterobacteriaceae uh, in dry environments? That's things you find a lot of on cardboard. Um, what about spoilage organisms, right? <clears throat> Especially if you're in dairy or breads um, like, or beers or anything that's using leavening and yeasts. Um, or let's say we care about an indicator organism. Um, do you care primarily about gram-negative gram organisms? And why do I keep talking about gram-negative organisms? Well, endotoxins. Um, talking about these heat labile uh, endotoxins that are really hard to kill and really hard to clean up. So you really need to be mindful um, that there are standards out there and it's not enough to say, well, I don't know. Um, no, you know, let's do the research, give Trace a call. We can help you navigate these types of standards um, because these standards are here to help you. Um, they'll help you walk through what a program in place really needs to have. Uh, sampling protocols, you need to identify your locations. You need to identify how frequently you're testing. What organism do you care about? What type of test method are you going to use? How are you going to be recording it? How are you going to be evaluating those records? Um, and all of that needs to be kept inside of a controlled document system. So um, it's just, it's really important that you start asking those questions. 
And then in the state side, we have the FDA, who even has um, the opportunity to do an on-site swab analysis for any risk-based pri prioritization. Um, we've seen before that establishments can have the FDA come in and do an audit and do an on-site um, swab test. And what they're looking for is, do you have control of that area that they swabbed? Um, and you'll see here on the right of this slide is a picture of somebody using a, a sponge swab. And so that's the FDA who subscribes a lot to the Food Safety Moder Moder Ner Modernization Act. Oh, sorry, that's a mouthful. Um, and they also use, um, it's called the BAM, the bacterial, um, uh, it's, it's basically a bacteriological methods, um, like chapter book that you can go through and it has all these methods and it has all these uh, different ways you can sample uh, foods and cosmetics and liquids. So that's definitely, and that's, um, public knowledge so you can definitely go online and just download some of that. <clears throat> okay. So now you know, now hopefully I've convinced you all right, it's important to have a monitoring system in place, but now you need to know how to do it. Um, you have come to this talk today not to talk about the importance of food safety, you already know. So let's really get into the nitty gritty of what it is when it's time to figure out how we're gonna sample. So ISO is an international standards organization. Uh, it focuses primarily on the most up-to-date technology that is available for whatever section of standard you're looking at. In this case, ISO 14698 is a clean room and associated controlled environment. Um, a lot of the times when people see the word clean room, their brain automatically takes them to pharma. Um, but I want you to start loosening that up in your mind and start really seeing what associated controlled environment means. Um, and let's talk about that a little bit. If you are monitoring something, then that means you need to have control of that area, of that facility, of that point of use. That is a controlled environment. So it is okay to use 14698 as a guide to making whatever procedural um, monitoring system that you need. ISO is always here to be helpful um, as a guide. And if you want to lean on it, um, they have informative and normative procedures. So part one is the general principles and methods. Um, it does not give you microbial limits. And we'll talk about that in a little bit um, about why that is. Um, and so a part of part one is talking about the impact of operations. So a lot of the times people think, okay, well, what, what, what is something that I could monitor? Well, part one gives you a list of ideas of what could be considered a part of a risk zone. That's compressed gases, compressed air, ambient air, equipment, uh, any monitoring or measuring devices, storage containers, walls, ceilings, floors, benches, chairs, bathrooms, uh, anything like that can all be considered worthy of uh, sampling on. So what kind of techniques can you use to identify these organisms? So we've talked a little bit about um, how when you walk outside, you take a deep breath, there are organisms in the air. We know that there are particles in the air, no matter what, um, unless you're in a bona fide clean room and you're gowned up, you got a bunch of HEPA filters, um, but those particles can be vectors. And what a vector is, is, and I've done an IFSQ in um, presentation before about particle contamination. And I said, the particle is the pony and the bacteria rides that pony wherever that particle is going. And so basically that's what a vector is. It's, it's the bacteria is hitching a ride on this particle. And so we need to be talking about bioaerosols and how to capture those. So when somebody is in a, uh, a room, they can add about 37 million bacteria to the air every hour. And so what you're seeing here on the right is a handprint of somebody's um, dirty hand, and they put it on a growth 
um, gelatin and it's called agarose. And basically there's nutrients inside this agarose that's capturing um, these organisms and giving them a nice, lovely place to live and land on. But when you are ready to start capturing these viable particulates, bacteria, yeast, mold, um, you need to be mindful of the techniques that are currently out there. So in order to do that, there are passive sampling techniques and active sampling techniques. Um, passive sampling is doing settle plates, contact plates, swabs, um, anything like that. If you're doing active, you're using a pump to, um, to suck in air or liquid to take an aliquot or a sample of the environment. And that's typically um, these automated air samplers, like what you see here on the right, which is a trio boss. Um, but you put this nutrient auger in there, you take the lid off, you close it, and it becomes an impaction sampler that, top, that sucks in air and lets the plates grow. So they're measured by the different type of media that you're putting it on. So what you see here on the right is broad spectrum. What broad spectrum means is if you are in a facility and you're like, okay, I really need to identify every type of organism that could grow on this conveyor belt, you would want a broad spectrum media. What that will do is it will uh, grow bacteria, yeast, and mold. There are limitations though. You need to be mindful. If you grow a organism that makes secondary metabolites, what is a secondary metabolite? It is a product of the organism that acts to inhibit or um, increase the growth of another organism. Uh, so penicillium is a fungus. It makes penicillin, um, which is an antibacterial. So broad spectrum has limitations. Um, not all the organisms could be captured on there. And so that's when you want to go into differential. So you could have a um, fungal only plate. That's Sauberon dextrose. That's malt extract auger. Um, these are the ones that have antibacterial properties inside of the recipe so that the only thing that can grow are the fungal organisms present at your site. So that is considered differential media. Then you have something called selective media. These are um, recipes in the gelatin that either only allow certain types of organisms to grow based on their metabolic processes. So E. coli in this case on the plate on the right would grow pink, uh, Klebsiella would grow this dark blue, Proteus, which is a swarmer, a swarmer means when you look at this plate, the word proteus, you see how it's kind of hazy around it. The organism has uh, the ability to, to move, to swim. It's got some flagella on it. And what you're seeing there is the swarming effect that proteus um, has. Then there's enterococcus. So all these types of organisms, if you buy a certain selective recipe, for your agarose plates, will can uh, do a color change, can do selective growth. Um, and those are the types of microbiological media that are available for contact plates. They're available for ambient air, compressed air, uh, water sampling, uh, clothing testing, all of that. So these are the different types of media. So when it comes to the lab. The lab puts it in an incubator, which is a glorified, um, you know, oven, and it's at a set temperature that makes these organisms happy. And so, if a lab gets these plates and they see um, patterns like this, these are countable. We would say one CFU, two CFU, three CFU, four, five, six, so on and so forth. Uh, what is a CFU? It's a colony forming unit. This right here, one CFU. It is not one bacterium. It is many bacteria that are forming one colony, one colony forming unit, uh, and two, three, four, and so on and so forth. 
This is also a higher bio burden. So this plate has less CFUs than this plate. And this would be considered too numerous to count. There's just too much growth on this plate. So when it comes to characterizing bacteria, you have tiers of identification. You've got what is called presumptive identification. That's using colony morphology. So what you're seeing on this plate here, this is a stock photo uh, from online. This isn't something that I specifically took because you'll see it dehydrated a little bit. This is a beautiful representation of the different types of colony morphology. Uh, you're not looking at the cell yet. You're looking at the colony. So this is um, like, this is like, this is like, this is different than this one. So these have different colony morphologies. That's done using macroscopic analysis. So if you are interested in um, colony morphology and that is what your monitoring plan is asking for, well, you can do something like that. Um, then you can go a little bit deeper and you can do gram staining. So let's take a step back. Gram staining is looking basically, so if we were to blow these up under a microscope, gram stain would, would show you um, just by default the shape of the cell. So now you're in cellular morphology. Colony morphology is this, now you're in cellular morphology. What is the shape? Um, so we have spheres are considered coccus, uh, rods are considered bacillus, and then you have some bacilli that have spores in them. So it's kind of like, it, it kind of looks like this. You would need a specific stain to see it, but that is microscopic analysis looking at cellular morphology. So gram negative rods will never look like a caucus, right? They're never gonna look like a basketball. A rod will look like a rod. So if you care about gram negative rods, then maybe you want to do cellular morphology identification. It's still considered presumptive. Presumptive is something that is used using your naked eye to look at the morphology of something or a color reaction. Um, Christian Graham discovered this staining method in 1884. That's why it's called Graham's stain. Um, and basically it's using four different reagents to color the cell wall of the bacteria. Not all bacteria can be done like this. Those, are, those that cannot are called indeterminate. But what you see here of gram negative bacteria is this really small cell wall on the outside. So uh, that, that cell wall is called peptidoglycan, but it's a very thin layer. And this purple reagent uh, because it's so thin, typically gets washed off over here. And what you end up seeing because of the last reagent uh, are them being stained pink. But gram positive organisms, so uh, things like staph, staphylococcus um, are gram positive. They have a very thick peptidoglycan layer or cell wall. And it's so thick that it holds on tight to this first reagent or crystal violet dye. And then what you get is this differential of uh, purple and pink, gram positive and gram negative. Um, all coliform um, producing organisms are gram negative. So if you only care about coliforms, then maybe you only wanna do gram staining. And then that would be enough to tell you, okay, I have, um, a presumptive identification for coliforms, I'm gonna do gram staining. But I need to be clear, some of these standards require confirmatory identification. What is confirmatory identification? I just told you presumptive identification is only looking at it either based on a color change or looking at it based on um, the morphology. Some of that can be, um, changed by the age of the organism, by your staining technique, all of that. So there's limitations. So when you do presumptive identification, oftentimes a protocol will ask, okay, if you get a presumptive identification of coliforms, you need to do a confirmatory identification 
just to be 100% sure. Um, and so we talked a little bit about what these gram negative rods are. Mostly they're found in gastrointestinal uh, tracts of mammals, uh, warm blooded mammals. That's where you get your E. coli and coliforms. Um, all gram, let's see, all coliforms are gram negative rods. Not all gram negative rods are coliforms. So just be mindful of that. Uh, gram positive cocci, it's typically what's on the what's on your skin uh, and mucosal membranes. So if you're seeing an influx of that, uh, just you need to start talking to your a team about aseptic technique. Was it used properly? Things like that. Um, gram positive rods, are they are they forming spores? Do you care about spores? Um, things like that. So that's all presumptive identification and information that you're getting from gram staining. So if your system is asking you confirmatory, um, you've basically made it down the list of the level of importance when it comes to identifying microorganisms. So from the top, you have enumeration. Maybe you only care if organisms are there. Maybe your food or food product needs to be sterile. In that case, it doesn't matter what's there. You just care how many are there. Um, in that case, you're good with enumeration. But if you care what type is there, then maybe you just want to know about presumptive identification, colony morphology, differential media, um, things like that. But if you are very specific, let's say uh, you've been dinged in the past for having listeria positive food products and you need to have 100% assurance that you don't have that organism there at the time of sampling, then your system might ask for, for confirmatory identification. And what that's doing is looking at phenotypic analysis or genotypic analysis. So these are the types of confirmatory identifications that are available for microbiology. Uh, phenotypic um, identification is what we're gonna talk about for the rest of my talk. Um, that is biochemical reactions, right? Uh, that is how is this little bacterium processing sugar? How is it processing this pH? How is it processing this salt? Um, and, and a number of other carbon sources. Uh, seriological reactions. It's looking at how it's processing the susceptibility of antimicrobial agents. You have uh, Staphylococcus aureus. Then you have methicillin resistant uh, Staph aureus. Then you have vancom resistant, vancomycin resistant. Then you have vancomycin methicillin resistant. Um, and so those are all types of phenotypic um, identification differences. Then you have the profile cell, cell proteins. That's fatty acid methyl ester analysis of the outer membrane of the organism that you're looking in. So what kind of little fatty acids are hanging out on the outer edge of the uh, cell wall <clears throat> around your organism? That's all phenotypic. And then on the other side of the, of the road is genotypic. And that is a little bit of what it says, genotype, gene. So that's hybridization uh, differences, plasmid profiles. What is this organism making that is specific to this organism or subspecies of this organism? Restriction enzyme digestion. Um, is this organism capable of, um, of chopping up this gene and these amino acids? So that's looking at the restriction enzyme profile. Uh, polymerase chain reaction. So that's looking specifically at genes that are present and activated in um, these organisms. And then there's whole cell sequencing, whole genome sequencing, excuse me. So that's the difference between phenotype and genotype. Um, that's metabolic biochemical versus DNA, RNA, um, and genotypes. So the biolog system is a great phenotypic tool that's used in microbial identification. What you see here at the top is a 96 well um, microassay. And this system has different plates for aerobes, anaerobes, yeasts, and filamentous fungi. So if you don't know, 
Aerobes are organisms that grow in the presence of oxygen. Anaerobes are organisms that grow in the absence of oxygen. So if you guys are testing nitrogen gas and you're worried about organisms growing in your nitrogen gas, then you're not going to choose to incubate your plates in an aerobic environment. You're going to choose to incubate your plates in an anaerobic environment. And so once we get those plates in, and if we have a colony that is present on that plate, then we know as the lab, all right, these guys want to do confirmatory identification of this colony that was isolated in their anaerobic test. And so we would use this 96 well plate to do that. And this color profiling is a phenotypic identification of the organism. And it comes with a qual value, and which is a qualifying value that gives you the assurance based um, on that organism and the library that is present. If you have yeasts, which are eukaryotes, so all of these are, um, so the aerobic plate can be done if you don't know if it's a yeast, um, because some of the yeasts look very similar to bacteria. But um, for the for the for most of your yeasts and filamentous fungi, you'll use these specific plates. Um, and again, these these 96 well plates give you a fingerprint identification of the phenotypic um, identification. And so what you have here is the biolog analyzes the ability of the cell to metabolize these biochemicals. And so this is a blown up version of the 96 well plate. Every well has a job. So there's 71 carbon sources present on the 96 well plate. Uh, one, one single uh, well is always a negative control. So there's nothing uh, covering that well. And so it shouldn't react to anything. And then um, you have your pH tests, you have your salts, your lactic acids. There's a gram stain reaction um, well. There are uh, carbolic acids, fatty acids, um, and all of these things are acting as chemical sensitivity reactions. So the uh, light source that's inside of this instrument is doing an optical density test based on the color and then doing these huge analyses um, based on that uh, style of fingerprint. And we'll look at that in a second. But one of the advantages of the biolog really is you guys are doing sampling for the lab. You guys are the ones in charge of making sure that you're not cross-contaminating your plates. So what that is, is once we get your plates, we incubate them. And this system is really cool because you're sampling it, which means I can pull a small, single colony forming unit, quickly prepare it into this um, extraction liquid, inoculate my 96 well plate, and then incubate it and read it. All of this prep time, all of that, it takes no time at all. So that level of speed is not something that you'll see with uh, genotypic analysis. The genotypic analysis requires a lot more uh, uh, finesse, a lot of time, uh, and it's pretty laborious. Whereas this is, let's pick off what you guys have sent us. We'll put it in this extraction liquid. We'll make sure the turbidity of this um, liquid is perfect for the inoculation of the 96 well plate. We'll put the 96 well plate in the incubator and we'll run it the next day. So that's about 24 hour turnaround for bacteria. It's a little bit longer for the eukaryotes like fungi and like filamentous fungi or yeasts, but that's because there's um, systematically different. You have eukaryotes or prokaryotes. Um, there's also this ability for, and I talked a little bit about how each well the fingerprint pattern uh, is evaluated uh, nearly 2,000 times in the system based on the library that we have. 
And so the biolog has a library of over 2,900 species of bacteria, yeast, and mold. Um, so that's a great way for you um, for us to identify. And if there isn't an identification, uh, the, the company is always offering upgrades to their libraries that labs are able to um, upgrade to. So that, that again, is a, just an, an enormous, powerful tool to be used for phenotypic analysis um, when, you're, when you're really concerned about turnaround. Um, and then there's the simplistic of reporting. So a lot of the times, let's say PCR, when you're doing a qPCR, that reporting is a little bit harder uh, and requires um, a knowledgeable expert to do that. With the biolog, it's comparing it against a library. And so it's a very um, easy to understand reporting system. Um, the biolab can identify almost four times more aerobic bacterial species than your traditional phenotypic systems. So there's some other systems out there like the Vitec, things like that. Um, and it's a little bit more advanced um, because of the strong qualification values. So I talked a little bit about that. What does it mean to have a qual value? And that is when you're looking at the library and the known compared to what your phenotypic fingerprint is. And then it gives you the qualification value for that. Um, and then the really great thing, and I touched on it a little bit, is that it doesn't require this upfront testing to determine which um, plate to use. So we do have four plates, aerobic, anaerobic, yeast, and filamentous fungi. If you're unsure, you can just pop it into the aerobic plate, get some answers up front. And then if you need to, because you are still undetermined, then you can use that first run that's 24 hours to pick a more appropriate 96 well plate. But most of the time, you won't even need to. The aerobic plate is enough. Um, so that is just, an, uh, just a really wonderful tool when it's talking about helping to report that information. And so one of the major things we talked about was making sure that you have document control. So what this is, is a uh, example report for a microbial report. So what you'll see here is a sterility blank. If you guys are doing any microbial testing, you need to have control of what media you're taking in because if I find out that you sent me a bunch of plates and they're all dirty, how do I know that the media that I sent you didn't arrive clean or that you didn't house it correctly unless you have a plate or a swab or something that is media. So if I if I give you a sleeve of plate, you need to leave one plate unopened from beginning to end of analysis. And that is considered your control plate or your sterility blank. And that should never have growth on it. And that is proving that from cradle to grave, from when you, I sent it to you to when I'm reporting it, there's no cross-contamination. Uh, that's what this is. And that less than one CFU is what you want. Um, you need to be able to have your sample date your unique identifying number for your plate ID, the description of the location. Let's say this is um, conveyor belt one, uh, ice cream pit two. Uh, you need to have the locations and the descriptions. And if you have a pass or fail, you should be able to see that immediately. You should be able to see what kind of spec you're reading. And then down here, um, you'll see genus identified. So for ISO class seven, they only require the identification of genus. So then you can do micrococcus or you can do staphylococcus species. This is not to say that the biolog cannot give you genus and species. No, no, that is spec specific. So this specification that this customer report had only wanted genus. So I'll only give you genus. But if you want species, I can give you species. Um, so just be mindful. Your reports need to be able to have that type of flexibility and easy to read because nothing is more frustrating than if you fail an audit and it's because you couldn't explain your report. 
So in summary, what we talked about today is monitoring your microbial bio burden means you have to test. I'll say it again. You cannot monitor something you are not testing. So just be mindful of that. If your procedures or the standards that you want to um, uphold, say monitor your microbial whatever, you need to be testing. Uh, testing is only as good as the moment you do it, though. So I am a huge proponent of quarterly testing. Um, a lot of these standards say annual, but a lot of things change based on um, quarters, right? What's happening in the quarters? Well, you're having um, humidity changes. Let me tell you, microorganisms love them some water. They love moisture. So, I mean, if you're not sampling during your highest humid season, does that matter to you? I don't know. That's up to your risk assessment. But I think it does. Um, and a lot of these standards require microbial monitoring. So you need to know what type of difference is presumptive, uh, confirmatory. Do they just want a number? Um, and let me give you an idea. Uh, ISO 14698, they require... Uh, confirmatory identification, but they give you the leeway to figure out what type of confirmatory identification uh, you can do. Um, and then I really can't stress enough of how powerful of a tool the biolog can be for your phenotypic identification. So if that's something that you're interested in or you want some more answers on, please, um, my email and our customer service number is at the bottom. And with that, I will take any questions you guys have. I think um, Simon's going to pop on here in a second, and then yeah. we can start our our questions. Okay, okay. Thanks very much for that, Maria. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Okay, so questions. Um, yeah, just a couple of housekeeping. Josie, yes, we follow up after the um, – an hour or two afterwards, we'll send you the recording – slides and certificate afterwards by email um yes yes you get the certificate as well okay so any questions for maria um about the topic um i've not picked up any so far um but yeah if you want to type them in now please feel free to do so um okay So just, I mean, just listening along there, um, you know, picking up on mic microorganisms. So how frequently should should we be, you know, testing? Could you just reiterate that? Because it, it does come up a lot, uh, that question. So um, it's really risk-based. I can't stress that enough. I can't, we get a lot of customer calls about, you know, Maria, just give me an answer. I just, I need an answer. It's like, well... Uh, where is your, where are you located? What system are you using? Is it direct? Is it indirect? Is it a medical device? Is it compressed air? Is it ambient air? Um, and, you know, the list goes on and on and on and on. I am a huge proponent of qu quarterly testing um, at minimum. Um, a lot of these standards, again, are at annual testing, but I'm a huge proponent of minimum quarterly testing. Okay, I'm such a fool. This is <laughs> this is the new revamped version of the webinar software, and the questions actually go in a different uh, stream that I've uh, I've just oh. been pointed out to me. So there are lots of questions. <laughs> so oh, the nice. first one from Justice: Should all the high risk points be monitored through a CCP? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, if they're high risk to you then they absolutely should be monitored. Okay. And uh, the next one from uh, Janice. Is compressed air suitable for in-process cleaning for cheese products, e.g. sachet filling of cheese powder? So if you're going to do compressed air, um, I know that HACCP -C 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 requires you to differentiate between um, direct or indirect contact and so if it is in direct contact 
then you need to definitely be monitoring your compressed air uh, microbial uh, bio burden. You need to be looking at particles, water, oil, all of the contaminants that could possibly occur for on direct contact. If it's indirect, let's say you're blowing off the conveyor belt before you put your cheese on it, then you need to be thinking about it as an indirect uh, risk. Okay, question from Graham Cox. Uh, presumably baseline microbial in air will vary seasonally in any location. Yes, that's exactly right. And that's exactly my point about why I'm such a huge proponent of quarterly testing. Um, so yeah, you're exactly right, Graham. Okay, uh, next one is from uh, Sol Vega. In general, enterobacteria is the same as coliforms. What is the difference in presentation? In the presentation slide, it was why in one place enterobacteria declared as pathogens, in other place as indicators. So these are just colloquial terms. Um, indicators depend on the level of risk. So these words are buzzwords in the quality standard world. Um, if you have indicator organisms that you care about, then your standard will typically say, you need to tell me if they're detected or not detected. For pathogens, pathogens are considered disease causing organisms. Um, then those typically need to be enumerated and defined by genus and species. An indicator organism is exactly that. It indicates you might have a problem. So an indicator organism can be a pathogen, and a pathogen most of the time is definitely on your indicated organism list. Okay, and another question from Solviga. Um, is it right to use passive plates air sampling for open product like peeled eggs because it shows particles really on the surface and active air sampling if product is in pipes closed. So with passive um, settle plates, I'm not sure. So I'm not sure how your peeled eggs are being peeled. I don't know if there's particles flying around in the air. But if, and that is a good point, and it's, a, it's mostly about risk-based. So if you don't feel, if you feel like your location has too many flocculent particles, what is flocculent? Flocculent is like when you open up powdered sugar and it goes, that is flocculent. So if you feel like your uh, location has too much of that, then you may not be a candidate for settle plates. You might be a candidate better for a sample swab. Um, so be mindful of that. You have options. Okay. A uh, question from Natalia. Uh, is it poss possible to contaminate CSD slash NCB through the packaging aluminium can after air rinse pass? I'm not sure what CSD or NCB is. But I can tell you if it's possible and it's a microbe, <laughs> then it's possible. Um, so uh, if you want to do me a favor and send me an email, Natalia, you totally can. And I'll, I'll research that one a little bit more. That's, that's a very specific question. Okay. We'll add your email to the uh, follow-up email that we send out, at Maria. Um, Great. Uh, a question from... Natalia, are there any special sanitary program for CO2 production, location, storage tank, distribution pipes, filters, etc.? Are there any types of microorganisms that exist in a CO2 environment? So right now, um, ISO 8573-7 is a compressed air standard. Uh, you can use it as a beautiful guide for a compressed gas. Um, compressed gases, if that's what you're looking at. There are also uh, CO2 incubator standards in ISO. I don't have that number off the top of my head, but that exists. Um, but you're speaking specifically of storage tank distribution piping. So I'm thinking you're thinking compressed CO2. And absolutely. Um, 
we use anaerobic pouches and anaerobic chambers and anaerobic um, biolog plates to analyze organisms that are isolated specifically from CO2 environments. And why does that matter? Because organisms that are anaerobic or thrive in the absence of oxygen need to maintain that absence of oxygen to grow properly and to exhibit the correct metabolic fingerprint. Um, and so we do that here at Trace. But yes, you do need to be mindful. Organisms grow in solely CO2. Okay, question from Echo. What is the difference between Biolog ID versus API test system? So Biolog ID is um, what I spoke about. Presumptive identification using a 96 well plate that speaks on over 12, over 2,900 phenotypic identification fingerprint profiles. API is very specific. It is a similar phenotypic identification that is specific to a select few of metabolic tests. And, that, and those cards are very specific to um, organism type. So what you want to do, APA is a type of phenotypic identification and biolog is a type of phenotypic identification. It's more about the accuracy precision um, that differs between the two, biolog being the better of the two in my opinion. Okay, uh, so Vega again, how much cost for laboratory, not for clients, uh, for one test of biolog identification? Have you any idea about that? I do have an idea, but I can't tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, you can definitely get with Biolog and they'll give you a, they'll give you a quote. Okay. Question from Olufemi. Uh, characterization biochemical traditional, the overall advantage, the and Biolog. Uh, it's a bit messed up that question, I think. Yeah. I think Together. what this question is asking is, what is the turnaround for a traditional biolog sample using biochemical um, test methods? And the answer is, well, if we can find a CFU within 24 hours of incubation, then we can take a sample of that CFU and within 24 hours give you a bacterial identification of an aerobic organism. If it is a filamentous fungi, then we can subgrow. We can take a sample off of your plate, uh, grow it up as a subculture, uh, and filamentous fungi take about um, seven to ten days to do identification. And why is that? It's the difference between a eukaryote and a prokaryote, and the difference between the rate of growth. Um, and so, yeah. Okay. A uh, question from uh, Echo, uh, another one, and uh, that's, could you please advise the brand or model for air pump sampling device for air sampling compressed air testing device? Yeah, so for here at Trace Analytics, for ambient air testing, we use the Trio Boss. Uh, there are a number of different impaction samplers that exist out there. That is the one we have here. For compressed air sampling, again, there are also a number of um, uh, equipment that's out there. Here at Trace, we use the SAS Pinocchio. Okay, uh, question from Rima. What should we do if there is VBNC, viable but non-culturable pathogen in the food that we've identified? What method can we apply or use in the case of VBNC pathogen? So for phenotypic uh, identification, that is one of the limitations. It is limited to the fact that you need to grow it up. If you have one that's viable, but it's not culturable, that's when you move on to qPCR. That's when you move on to genotypic um, growth. And typically what you'll do is if you know there's a viable particle in there, you'll, you'll um, isolate it in a liquid culture and move forward that way. But that's using genotypic identification. Okay, okay. And Mario, uh, what about ISO 17025 to support a lab? Are you, are you all for that? So here at Trace, we are A2LA ISO 17025 2017 accredited. Um, it is my 
huge hope for all of you that you, if you are using a third party laboratory like Trace Analytics, that you make sure that laboratory is accredited. Um, 17.025 is a uh, is a like a quality system that tells you you need to control your documents, control your methods, um, and have all of the required documentation in order for calibration, NIST traceable um, items where applicable. Okay, clear. Uh, Leanne, how and would you define at rest and at work status for swab, sponge, et cetera, microbiological analyses? Would it depend only if it's in use and are people in the room or would it depend on the readiness for work? So at risk basically means you tell everybody in the room, there's a couple of different ways to define at risk. One way is you tell everyone in the room to leave and it's, six o'clock in the morning and nobody is in the area and you take a swab at work means everything is happening normally around that area and you are taking a swab of that so basically you're doing a little bit of let's see what it looks like when no one's in the room let's see what it looks like when people are working in that area that's the difference between those would it depend only if it's in use or if people are in the room yeah yeah so that's that's what that's about Okay, thanks. Um, Olifemi, what is the turnaround time for the test? Uh, for enumeration, it depends on your standard uh, for compressed air. Right now, 8573 is 10 to 14 days. For ambient air, if you're using ISO 14698, um, it can be anywhere between uh, seven days and 10 days, or if you only care about bacteria, yeast and mold, it all depends on what organism you're looking at. Um, I want to go back to that rest and at work question. The other option is if you have a conveyor belt at rest means you haven't turned it on, you're taking a swab. If it's at work, it means you've turned the conveyor belt on um, or whatever piece of equipment, and you've put the swab there and you've let it go through an entire cycle um, to make sure maybe it's not the rollers that are cross-contaminating. So just be mindful of that uh, when you're thinking about at work and at rest. Okay, a question from Richard. Hi, Maria. I might have missed this in your presentation. How much is the cost per testing using Biolog system and what's the turnaround time for results? So the cost is dependent on the the organism that is found, the number of organisms that are found. I need to stress that one of those 96 well plates is for one single CFU that is an isolated pure colony. So that is one of the most important things. That is the limitation to all identification, uh, genotypic or phenotypic. Um, so just be mindful of that. Um, in terms of cost, it depends if it's aerobic, anaerobic yeast. Um, it all, and same with turnaround. I talked a little bit about how eukaryotes and prokaryotes differ. So it's anywhere between as fast as 24 hours to anywhere as long as 14 days. Okay, question from Laxman. Um, do you have a turnkey type of service where you provide all the necessary kits with the specific media and the actual? test the actual <laughs> yeah, yeah we actually do here at trace analytics you just give us a call we will set you up with the we can give you a risk assessment if you need help with that we can then give you the kit you need to sample for it we'll send you all the media we'll send you the uh the cooler and the shipping necessities to send it back to us we will then analyze it for you and we'll give you an accredited um report all in one turnkey system yep okay tamika in your opinion is basic atp swabbing sufficient daily verification for c and s so atp swabbing is a lot different than what i talked about today atp stands for adenosine triphosphate it is a um, biomolecule that is present if any sort of uh, living tissue was present on or near whatever you're swabbing. 
ATP is a great indicator monitor. So what I would say for that is ATP swab, if you're worried about it or if it's low risk, if it's positive, you definitely need to go into confirmatory identification. All ATP swabbing is going to do is tell you that, hey, something that is living was here. So um, that is what okay. that is. Okay. And Nikichi, uh, what can we use as a benchmark to monitor contaminants in compressed air in pastry production? Um, right now, there are no limits for compressed air. So a lot of people either use clean room limits. There are, so 80, so this is compressed, this is a compressed air question. ISO 8573-1 has purity requirements and purity limits and purity classes for compressed air particulates. Microorganisms are a viable particulate contaminant. 8573-1 gives you limits for particles. Therefore, if you wanted to, you could argue that the particle value just needs to remain in your particle class. If you want particle uh, limits from viable microorganisms, one, I'm rewriting that standard, so just give me a couple of years and we'll get there. Uh, two, what I would do is take the ambient air micro bio load and make sure that your compressed air is less than the ambient air at your intake. That is one good guideline in general. Okay. Uh, question from Nate. Uh, uh, I'm also wondering on the approximate cost of the 66 microplate. Uh, so the, mm, oh, so 96 well microplate. Yeah. So that's for the biolog and you'll definitely want to give them a call if that's something you want to do. Um, it has to be done inside of a laboratory, inside of a clean area. So it's not something you can just purchase and then, you know, put together, uh, a laboratory would need to do it after they isolate your colony forming unit. So if you're interested in that, definitely give us a call. Okay, we're 13 minutes over, but we'll keep going. Uh, Jorge, uh, what are the conditions to the transport sampling mediums? So for transporting your media, you need to always adhere to the OEM, the original equipment manufacturer. So whoever's making the uh, sampling media will dictate the storage and transport requirements of your media. Here at Trace, we use room temperature TSA storage, but if we're shipping it, because we're in Texas, and let's say it's August, we ship it with um, ice packs to make sure that it's cool, never ever frozen. Um, there are some uh, medias that can be frozen, um, but typically gelatinous agarose media cannot be frozen. Uh, question from Ian. Uh, if making a plant-based food like oat milk where gram-positive pathogens are less high risk and yeast and fungi are more relevant like Don Zon, aflatoxins and other fumicins, then is phenotype testing, is it beneficial to detect all types of activity on finished food types? Quite a long question. Yeah, so... If you're worried about gram-positive pathogens, yes, you can do that even just doing a presumptive identification. Uh, if you worry about the presence of yeast and fungi, again, you can do presumptive identification. But if you're worried about aflatoxins, not all fungal organisms produce aflatoxins. So you would need to do confirmatory identification. If you find out that your fungal organism is an organism that produces aflatoxins, then that is a great way of having confirmation that the organism is present. <clears throat> the biolog will not identify aflatoxins. The biolog will identify the organism that produces aflatoxins. There are uh, confirmatory tests that are more serological based that identify aflatoxins or endotoxins. Um, but the biolog and qPCR um, 
at least specific primers of qPCR. We'll do uh, species and gen genus based. And then, um, yeah, you need a different type of test for the toxins themselves. Okay, we'll just take a few more and might have to pick up later on uh, others. Maria, where can we get information about reference figures for the number of microbes allowed in every environment? I told you, I told you, this is the number one question, man. It's hard. Uh, it, I wish that I could tell you the number, the magic number. Um, it's just, it's going to be risk-based. It's going to be location-based. It's going to be um, product-based uh, and temperature-based. Uh, do you have a kill step? Do you not have a kill step? Is it ready to eat? Is it going to be in a modified, um, what is it called? Mod modified atmospheric packaging. Um, all of these things are always going to influence the limit of your microbial standard. So um, I can't give you a number, but what I can do is tell you that um, a lot of the pharmaceutical SOPs that exist are really good for clean and sterile type of situation. So you can start there for an answer. Okay. Uh, Aswati, for control air quality, is it effective using a HEPA filter? If yes, what size should it be? So your HEPA filters are going to be good for your HVACs um, or for any of the um, areas that you want to definitely keep particulates in microbial uh, contaminants out of via your HVAC system and air producing systems. Um, microorganisms, viable ones can range anywhere between one and a half to three uh, micrometers all the way up to the largest organism in the world is actually a filamentous fungi here in the United States. It spans most of the continent of uh, the United States. So I would say, <laughs> It, it differs on uh, what you're trying to capture. If you want just viable particulates, then, you know, the one micrometer would be ideal. If you carry about, if you care about toxins, you would need to go definitely smaller. And I'm not sure how small HEPA filters do. Okay. Uh, Mark, what is the best, meth best method for measurement of uncertainty, bottom up or bottom down? I should be that top down. don't know. <laughs> um, measurement of uncertainty can definitely be done when you're doing a uh, quantitative analysis. So when you're doing enumeration, you can definitely get measurement of uncertainty. Um, with qualitative measurements like gram staining, uh, there is no measurement of uncertainty. There is only limitation to the technique. Um, okay. Um, nearly done. Uh, question from Nancy. Um, uh, how far is the difference in cost for some uh, per sample using Biolog versus other rapid tests such as Petrofilm? Um, so it can be pretty uh, different, actually, because Petrofilm will just do a differential color change, um, and it will only be one thing that it's looking at. So there is specific, um, I'm thinking McConkey. Um, agarose that changes colors, but it's only metabolizing one single metabolic difference, whereas the biolog is looking at 96 different uh, metabolic changes. So yeah, the, <laughs> I would definitely say the difference is um, there, but it's not as dramatic as you would think. But if you're really curious, you can give us a call and I'll give you the actual number. Okay, yeah, uh, on that note, uh, Alexander will put, uh, as we've said, Maria's email uh, in the follow-up email that will include the slides, the recording, certificate, etc. Okay, last last two. <laughs> uh, Leanne, I would like to clarify, swabs could be used for hard to get places and sedimentation plates for particle-free areas, but wouldn't one show the contamination of surfaces and the other of air? Could they be used equally, one in the place of another? So the only issue I've ever had with settle plates is if you're going to have it um, around people, 
Uh, and what do I mean by that? So air, you're at the, with subtle plates, you're at the whim of um, the air movement in the room. So typically subtle plates need about four hour minimum uh, sampling times. Uh, whereas if you get a, a active sampler that has a vacuum pool, you're doing a five to 10 minute test and you're done. Um, and you get a beautiful representation of the viable particulates in the in the air versus a four hour test. Um, but you're right, if you do a four hour test, then you get the four hour um, presence of what's in that room. And the next question you had was swabs can be used for hard places, uh, but wouldn't one show the contamination? Yeah, and so that's the other thing is swabs are good for hard to reach places because settle plates are only as good as the surface they're on uh, and the air that is around that surface. Same with the active uh, impaction samplers. They're only as good as the air that they're pulling in. They're not pulling air from underneath them. They're pulling air from above and beside them. So if you wanna know what's going on over there, either you add more sampling sites or you can do the swab. Okay, and the final question that I can see uh, from Laxman, uh, is your lab trace analytics limited to only air and not product testing? Uh, we do surface testing, we do swab samples, we do um, uh, clothing tests for the contact plates. We can do um, ambient air, compressed air, so those things. But we do not do food analysis right now. Okay, okay, right. That's it, brilliant. <laughs> 23 minutes over. Uh, sterling That's job okay. as usual, Maria. Uh, Thanks, lots, Simon. Lots of questions. Yeah. I thought there was none. <laughs> <Brilliant. laughs> <laughs> All right. So thanks very much, Maria. I'll see you again Great. soon. Great. Okay. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Okay. Uh, I'll just uh, put your certificate in the sidebar, everybody. Um, yeah, so you can uh, click that link and that will take you to... Uh, if you click the download now button, it should just open a new window uh, and automatically download. It's an image, a PNG image. So you can either print and sign it manually with a pen, or you can uh, put it in image, bring it into an image editing software and uh, type your name. Okay. So thanks for your attendance today. Uh, it's been great. Uh, get into grips with the new platform. But uh, thanks for your attendance. It's Friday, best day of the week. Have an enjoyable rest of your day and have a lovely weekend. And we'll see you on the next one. Take care, everyone. Bye.